Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. It's good to have everybody this morning. Glad that you are here. I want to give you a little bit of a preview for tonight. At six, our uh, supported gospel servant, Carl Vano, uh, will be with us at six o'clock. Uh, he is with CLAIM, which is Christian Layman Assisting International Ministries. They do a number of hands-on projects and whatnot. And he'll be here presenting that, mission, um, that work and also um, presenting some missions works out in the Philippines. I believe he has a video to share with us. And he was formerly a missionary there, as you may recall. Um, and then he'll be preaching uh, for us tonight and excited about that. Then Wednesday night at 7, we'll be in Genesis chapter 21 with a message titled, Blessed are the Peacemakers. We're called as disciples to be peacemakers, and we'll see an account in the life of Abraham in which he was called upon to be a peacemaker. And the question is, can we be at peace with a world of conflict around us? Um, so we'll look at that Wednesday night, Blessed are the Peacemakers. In Matthew 20, we begin this text with the third occasion Matthew recorded of Jesus soberly fixing the attention of his disciples on his coming betrayal, sentencing to death, suffering at Roman hands, crucifixion, and resurrection. What Jesus spoke of here, we look back on and call it the good news, the gospel. It is the main thing for us. We are a church, not just any uh, group of people. We are a church that belongs to Jesus. And we are instructed to only let our lifestyle individually and corporately be fitting the gospel we read of here. Well, how can we do that? Well, Jesus and his answer to an ambitious request, will tell his disciples, the twelve, how they could do that, and thus he will tell us. So notice, please, verse 17 of Matthew chapter 20 with me. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, that being the Romans, to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? What can I do for you? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. He got mad at them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Messiah with steadfast focus on his Father's will to suffer and die at the hands of man and for man and yet to rise again. 
The Messiah's followers with steadfast resolve to be better than each other. What a contrast. He, their king, humbly being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. They, his followers, proudly being ignorant and angry at one another in pursuit of their own greatness. What a paradox. So our message this morning is titled this, The Pursuit of Greatness. The Pursuit of Greatness. And at risk of giving it all away before we even get into it, you need to know, greater than equals less than among Christ's disciples. I said, I didn't know we were in math class this morning. I'm sorry. Please excuse my, never mind. Greater than equals less than among Christ's disciples. And you need to feel less important than everyone else. You say, unbelievable. We often like to feel more important than everyone else, don't we? But you need to feel less important. And you need to act. You need to pick up a hammer and nails and nail your ambition, your pride, your ignorance, your anger to the cross so you can pick up a towel and serve his church. It's Christ's will for Emmanuel Baptist Church that every disciple pursues greatness by becoming sacrificial servants of his church. The pursuit of greatness. Behold, Jesus and his disciples went up to Jerusalem. And the highest leaders in Jerusalem assembled privately and consulted with one another to take Jesus and kill him, much like a snake would sneak and snatch its prey. And one of the twelve that Jesus had poured his life into for the past three and a half years was missing as preparation for the Passover began, yet suddenly he reappeared to sit down with Jesus at even when the sun set to eat that sacred Jewish meal of remembrance. And as they ate, Jesus remarked soberly, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And sorrowfully they asked who it could be. The betrayer himself, Judas, even asked and received an affirmative answer. Yet somehow it was lost on the disciples, except of course Judas. The words of his master rang in his ears, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Later, in deep agonizing prayer, in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried from face first on the ground, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And it was not long after that that the betrayer was at hand, and lo, Judas entered the garden with a great mob of Jews from the chief priests and elders with swords and other uh, instruments of, of warfare. And Judas immediately came to Jesus and greeted him and kissed him. And Jesus looked him in the eye and he said, Friend, why are you here? Wherefore art thou come? Then the mob grabbed Jesus, and they took him, and he asked them, Are you come out with weapons as against a criminal to arrest me? You never laid a hand on me when I taught daily in the temple. And arrested, his disciples forsook him and ran. He was led to the high priests, scribes, and elders who failed to find any false witness to sling mud that would stick to Jesus' life. And finally, they found two who accused him of saying that he could destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest questioned Jesus, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. To which Caiaphas demanded, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. 
And Jesus responded, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest, he ripped his clothes and said, He's spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, Thou Christ, who is it? Who is he that smote thee? He was betrayed, and he suffered many things of these men until they sentenced him to death and handed him over to the Gentiles as he said they would. It wasn't long after that, a mob screamed for his crucifixion and the release of a murderer in his place. They wanted his blood shed and were willing to be responsible for the crucifixion of this just man. The governor Pontius Pilate had Jesus scourged. There's little mention of this with no detail, yet would have been the equivalent of two Navy SEAL-sized Roman soldiers tying the man to a post to expose his back and secure him in place and going to town with torture instruments such as these. And dozens and dozens of lashes ripping open the flesh, body, and organs of our Lord till he would have been in ribbons. And they took him into a hall with nearly 500 soldiers. Cruel men who hated Jesus. A Roman iron fist. And they stripped him. They dressed him in a scarlet red robe. They made a crown for this king to wear on his head, and they made it out of thorns. And they put a reed in his right hand as if he had a royal scepter, and they bowed the knee before him and paid homage to this king in mockery. Hail, king of the Jews! And they spit upon him, the scripture says. And they took the reed out of his hand, and they smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. When they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink, he would not dope himself up so that he could not feel the pain of what he was experiencing, and they crucified him, they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. There he hung, bleeding, dying, humiliated, mocked, between two criminals. And from noon to about three o'clock in the afternoon, the land was totally dark. And some Roman historians described it as being an eclipse, but Jesus' words about three o'clock suggest something more sinister. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken him? And his own God, his own father, left him alone in darkness. And after he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up his life and died. And as a friend of mine said, it wasn't something they took, it was something that he gave. By nightfall, his body had been removed from the cross and lovingly placed in a new tomb. And the next day found his religious enemies among the Jews demanding the Gentile authorities to set a watch, a guard at the tomb to make sure his disciples would not steal his body and claim that he had risen for, you could hear him saying, that deceiver said while he was yet alive after three days, I will rise again. And he was a deceiver, wasn't he? I mean, his deceived disciples sent women to steal his body, didn't they? And Christianity and churches and Christ followers down through history have lived and hoped and died for a liar and his lie. No. No. You see, the first day of that next week, the tomb was found empty by women. That was a big deal because the testimony of men was a thing then, not women. You want to listen to the testimony of a, a woman? If, and if liars such as the disciples were perceived to be wanted to make their story sound a little better, they would not have put in there that women first discovered the empty tomb. But they reported it as it happened. And an angel told these women to tell the disciples he, Jesus had risen as he said. And as they ran to tell the disciples, Jesus met them with peace on his lips and hope for his disciples. 
And when his disciples, the eleven, met him on that mountain in Galilee, they worshipped and even wondered how this was possible. Yet there they were, and they beheld their king, who had been betrayed, who had been sentenced to death, who had been mocked, who had been scourged, who had been crucified, who had been totally rejected by mankind, yet risen again indeed. And their king commanded them to teach all nations as he had taught them. And what had he tried to teach them repetitively? Again and again as they headed to Jerusalem. What was his focus on as they fought among themselves for power and prestige and prominence? What did he step aside in the way to get the twelve apart from the dis- traffic and the, the dis- traffic, the distractions and the traffic to, to think about? He wanted them to fix their attention on what was coming. His betrayal, his unjust sentencing, his mocking, his scourging, his crucifixion and resurrection. And that is the good news. But to them it was bad news. It's somehow that they didn't want to wrestle with in their minds. But that is the good news that he wants to fix our attention upon. That he suffered. And he was crucified. And he rose again. That message has serious, eternal, and temporal implications for us who believe it. We preach Christ crucified. To, hu- to us who believe that message is God's power to save us from our sinful self-destruction and secure us eternally with Him. To us who believe that message is God's wisdom to equip us with skill to live life successfully in a selfish world. Paul cried, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ, the crucified, risen Christ, liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The cross of Christ liberates believers of his gospel from law that condemns and sin that binds and self that ensnares. The cross of Christ provides full and free forgiveness forever to all who repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ. All that we had time and appetite to hear unendingly the unsearchable riches of Christ and feast at his table of mercy. He wants to fix our attention to his death and resurrection, for in him we live forever, and in him we put to death ourselves. But as is often the case with us, his disciples were distracted from beholding what he wants us to behold, aren't we? And what is it that distracts us from his cross? We behold it. He wants us to fix our eyes upon the gospel. What is it that distracts us over here? And what is it that squirrel? It squirrels our attention away from who he is and away from self-denial I am called to with my Savior. A daily taking up of my cross, a forsaking of all to follow him. What is it that distracts me from that? It's a crown. A throne. It's position, it's prestige. It's honor, it's esteem. It's the old subtle lie of the snake in the garden. You will be your own God. It's a pseudo-worship that recognizes he is king, but seeks to use who he is to get ahead of you. It's a never-ending addiction to my own attention. It's a desire to be important, a wingman to Jesus, a second in command of our head, the Son of God. It's a sinister sickness in the souls of disciples who are ignorant or at least living ignorantly of what it means to follow Christ to eternal glory. And they become indignant and angry toward other disciples when, when we get a, a sniff of that sickness in them that we happen to nurse in our own souls. We're distracted from the cross and the empty tomb by our own pursuit of greatness. And rather than lowliness of mind, our thoughts are lofty of self. And rather than esteeming other better than self, self is pampered 
at others' expense. And rather than looking on the things of others, our eyes are fixed on our own things. Thus, life has its strife. Complaints and arguments abound where self and self-greatness is pursued. It happens among disciples. It happened among the twelve. James and John with their mother, a they appeared to pay humble respect to Jesus, but their request revealed their homage was surface deep. Having been told by Jesus earlier, as you recall, that they would reign with him on thrones, judging their own tribes, when God made all things new in the regeneration, when the Son of Man would sit on the throne of his glory, having been promised that of Jesus, remember, to suffer with Jesus is to reign with him, they wanted thrones whose authority somehow put them over the other disciples. I mean... Practically speaking, they had seen things the other disciples had not on the Mount of Transfiguration, if you recall. James, John, and Peter went up there and they saw things the other disciples did not get to see. And the only other one who had seen that was Peter, the first. But Jesus had just rearranged, if you remember last week, first to last. So maybe the sons of Zebedee perceived perceived an opportunity and they seized it. And they asked through their mother, to be great. Can't say no to mama. To be the greatest next to the eternal king. And Jesus said, you don't really understand what you're asking. See, he was about to drink a bitter cup. He was about to be immersed. That's what the word baptized means. He was about to be immersed, baptized into terrible shame and suffering. That was how his path to the kingdom and the crown was paved. But they weren't really feeling the weight of that. I mean, they were thinking, no pain, no gain, right? We got this. We are able to drink your cup too. We are able to be immersed in sorrow as well. And Jesus didn't disagree with them. You saw it in verse 23. He said, you shall drink indeed. You shall indeed be baptized. They would, both of them, drink a bitter cup. And and they'd be immersed in sorrow. And that would happen first when Jesus would be killed. Or I'm sorry, when Jesus' words would come true. And all those things would happen to him. But then it would happen later when James himself would be killed by Herod with the sword. And John would be banished to an island in old age where he'd write the revelation of Jesus Christ. They would drink of that cup. But those realities were distant, if not non-existent in their understanding and feelings. They did not get it. And Jesus could not give them their request. Who sat at his left and right hand was up to the one Jesus humbled himself to obey. His father in heaven. You know, disciples, we reveal our childish ignorance when we pursue prominence over other disciples. When the attitudes that pervade culture are carried into kingdom outposts, otherwise known as churches, When those attitudes are carried in there by Christians, they demonstrate how out of touch they really are with two things. The cost of actually following Christ and what it actually means to be submitted to his Father. To follow Christ is to gulp down a bitter cup of self-denial and brutal suffering. To forsake all for him is to be baptized with fire that burns off all desires, wants, affections, and lusts that characterize selfish sinners, not disciples of Jesus Christ. Greatness is given by God. It's not gained by man. And he prepares authoritative positions of prominence for who he will sit in those seats. But when we feel other disciples are gunning for seats that we have reserved for ourselves in our own minds, we get angry. We do this from offices, positions of oversight, such as pastors who have oversight over a church, but can sometimes want to be more authoritative than Jesus actually makes us. We do this from positions of service, deacons, who may reach for authority in decisions that Christ never gave anyone outside of churches and their pastors. 
We do this when we feel that our opinion might not count the way we would prefer. We do this when we have a ministry and we own it so much that no one can offer input, thoughts, or guidance. When fill-in-the-blank ministry or fill-in-the-blank class or fill-in-the-blank service becomes mine forever and I attach my significance to my role rather than my master's love for me. We do this in our homes when we think, man, I'm the king of this domain and we act like it. We are performance-driven people who get angry when we might be outperformed by someone else because, well, Jesus will love me less when I'm less than you? What? Our pursuit of greatness can cause plenty of trouble in our hearts and among a church and a family, can it? Can't it? But Jesus addressed it. You saw verse 25. He basically told them, look at the world. Look at the Gentiles. Look at the Romans. Rulers rule. Great ones are in charge. Dictators dictate, tyrants tirade, and I don't think he was speaking ill of authority structures because he taught submission to authority. He taught later on, we'll see in Matthew 22, he said, render unto Caesar the things that be of Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And there is authority in our life. There is authority in a church. But he's just talking about in general the ways of the world. As you reach the top of the ladder, you to boss. And greatness is about power, prestige, authority, prominence, importance, and power is the end, and people are a means to that end. But it shall not be so among you, he said. Not among disciples, not among a church, not among a family that claims to be Christian. Someone wants to be great, you picture a prince. Jesus said, let him take off his Burger King crown and become a minister of other disciples. It's interesting, the word minister in verse 26 and also in verse 28, the Greek word is diakonos, which is transliterated, trans, transliterated later or transliterated as deacon and later used as the actual office in a church. The root of that role is found right here, uh, the root of the role in that church. And so you literally could say it like this, uh, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your deacon. Verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be deaconed unto, but to deacon. That's literally the word that is used. It is an idea of, of ministry, of behind the scenes service, of, of just this, I'm just here to serve and subject myself to what I'm supposed to do. Someone who wants to be great, he's to remove his Burger King crown that he has placed upon his head, and he is to become a servant. It's like you picture two boys in the same family, and they go to Burger King, and one, he puts a Burger King crown on his head, and suddenly he becomes the boss of the place ground and whatever he wants to play that's what everybody else is going to play but the other the other brother he decided to go because they don't clean the playground the tables in there anyways you know i'm just kidding go to chick-fil-a no the, he goes and he finds a rag or he finds something to wipe off the tables after you see this other brother wiping off the tables in the play he doesn't have to do that i mean he's there to play go play son. no but he's cleaning off the tables and he's cleaning up after his family there's a vast difference between the one who wants to be great and the one who'll just serve. Someone wants to be chief. First. In charge. You picture a CEO in a suit. Jesus says, let him take off his suit. Put on slave clothes and become a slave of other disciples. See two men walk into a church. One, he... He wants to be prominent. He wants people to listen to him. He wants to be the mic drop prognosticator. Or pontificator? I don't know. I don't remember what he says. A pontificate is the chief one. It's used of the Pope. He wants to be the number one. In any situation, in any room, he wants his opinion, his thoughts, his spiritual sageliness to be feasted upon by others. And then you have someone over here. And he's just coming. He, he sees himself as having no rights there. But he is obligated to be a slave to his people. Whatever they need, I'm here to provide. You see, greater than equals less than. 
and Christ's kingdom. Greater than equals less than among his disciples. Greater than equals less than in his churches. To be something and someone is to become nothing and no one. You're not in charge. You're under authority. You're not the boss. You're a slave. See, Jesus Christ was the son of the living God. He had power on earth to forgive sins, heal the sick, cast out demons, calm storms. He was the Lord of Jewish holy days. He was the eternal king of God's people. He was not taking anything away from God to be his equal as his son. Yet he chose no reputation. He chose the form of a slave. He chose the likeness of frail man. And when he could have been waited on by all the royal hostesses of heaven, he came and ministered to harlots, tax collectors, lepers, and bickering selfish disciples. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the cross, a giving of his life, a ransom in exchange for the perishing lives of those who chose rebellion who chose sin, who chose bondage. And that's why God raised him from the dead and gave him a name of, that is above every name, that at his name, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hear me, disciple. If you desire greatness, that's fine. Just let God redefine it for you. And let the mind of Christ lead you to drive the cross daily through the ambitions of your selfish soul. Choose to be nothing. Dear church, for us, to become nothing is to truly become we in Christ. We are slaves of one another. We submit to one another. We are overseen. So there is yet, in every level of authority, if there is an authority structure of churches that God has ordained, even within that, you see the call to be slaves to one another. We're overseen, shepherded, pastored by pastors called this servants of the Lord who are to give themselves to the literal, literal wording in Acts 6, the deaconing or ministering of the word and prayer. And this is how they're to do that, not as lords, but in gentleness and willingness and blamelessness. We are served by deacons, appointed to deacon or minister tables and protect the unity of the we by carrying out physical ministries and following the oversight of the pastors. We submit ourselves as disciples, one to another in the fear of God, desiring His ways, desiring His will, desiring His wisdom to guide us in all things. And we are content to do whatever is called upon us to do to serve Christ and His church so His church reaches its best in Him. You see, my importance, significance, and greatness fades in light of my king, in light of his sacrifice for us, in light of my service as just a little slave boy to his people. And the one somebody among us became a nobody for us didn't he? To become somebody to God. If you desire greatness in God's kingdom, become a servant among Christ's disciples. Greater than equals less than in Jesus' church.